make sure this works. All right, great. Hi. This is a picture of astronaut Peggy Whitson. She's on a spacewalk outside the International Space Station. Imagine floating out there in space. You, you know, look down at the Earth. It's 100 miles below you. You're feeling so small and insignificant, looking out at the vastness of space around you. And despite feeling so small, you might feel comforted knowing that you have the support of an incredible team of scientists at NASA who are using the latest in technology to plan this mission for you, to use data and models to let you do your job as effectively and as safely as possible. Or so you'd hope. This is Miles Solomon, a 17-year-old from Great Britain who was looking through some of the data that NASA makes publicly available. He noticed some abnormalities. Miles was looking at radiation sensor data, radiation sensors like one that he's holding in his hand. Those sensors are located on the space station and they record different levels of radiation in the environment. When they detect some radiation, they log a positive value indicating that severity. And when no radiation is detected, they should be recording a zero value. But instead, what Miles found was that the sensors were recording negative numbers. This is potentially a very big deal. We don't know exactly how this data was being used, but you can imagine there's a model somewhere that's taking this data into account to assess the safety of a potential space mission. Without being able to account for the negative readings that we have in this data, we might think that there's less radiation out there than there actually is. Looking at this data, you, you might make the decision to have a go on a spacewalk instead of a no-go. That could be pretty dangerous. This is a case where data really can mean the difference between life and death. The really crazy thing about this story is that the domain experts here, the scientists at NASA, did think that these negative readings were possible. They didn't think that they would happen that often, though, not enough to make a difference, maybe once a year. What Miles was showing was that this was clearly happening far frequently than once a year, and if they had just put some data quality checks in, if they were understanding their data a little bit better, it would have saved them a little bit of embarrassment by having a 17-year-old call them out on some of their data. Some of us here may be looking at scientific data, others at product data or financial data or software data, but data quality and understanding data shifts is something that's important to, to all of us. So today I hope that you can come away with some considerations for thinking about data quality and anomaly detection first and foremost when you design data pipelines and when you're starting to consume data. Unfortunately, I won't have enough time to get into many details about specific statistical techniques that we're using or the technology implementations that we have. The goal is to keep this talk pretty high level and, and concepts that you can take away and bring back to your organization. But I'd be happy to get into more details later, so please come find me or one of my Netflix colleagues at our office hours, which will be after the lunch. Let's talk about some of the data that Netflix looks at. We have uh, 100 million members. We just crossed this threshold, and it's very exciting for us, but we still have a long way to go. But those 100 million members live in countries all around the world, and they collectively stream over 125 million hours of content every day. That's a lot of, of watching Netflix. That's, that's really binging right there. Uh, if, we, if we do a little bit of math, back of the math envelope here, and we assume that an hour of Netflix content in high definition, high quality, is about three gigabytes of data, multiply that times your 125 million hours, and we're needing to deliver 375 petabytes of data to our customers every single day. That's a lot of data. That's the equivalent of uh, something like 80 million DVDs chock full of, of storage. It's, it's a lot of information. You might wonder, how do we deliver 375 petabytes of data every day without breaking the internet? And here's the answer. This is a server that Netflix has developed. It's custom built to hold all of the video files, the audio files, the subtitles, everything that you as a customer need to stream Netflix. 
We take these servers and we distribute them all around the world to make them as close to our customers as possible. There's one sitting in a data center in your city. There's one maybe sitting inside your ISP, your internet service provider's own internal network. The goal of this localization is that when our customers need to stream all that data, it doesn't have to travel very far to get to them, which means that, that we actually get to deliver a really high performance Netflix experience every single time. A great thing about these servers, in addition to allowing us to uh, very efficiently stream Netflix, is that they give us a lot of data, so it makes our data teams very happy. What's actually happening when you stream Netflix is that you've loaded up your device, it's a little hard to see, but you have a device and you've browsed around in the UI, you found something that you want to watch and you click play. Your device sends a request to one of these servers asking for a piece of content. The, device, uh, the server says, okay, that checks out, you can watch this piece of, of content, let me send some of that data back to you, the first chunk of that particular video. Your device receives that data, data it's in, uh, decoding it, it's rendering it in your UI, on your screen, and playing back. And you're asking for a little bit more data, the next piece of that video, uh, so on and so forth. The server sends that data back, and we're doing this all in real time so that we can adapt to various network conditions that your device is experiencing. That's the, the product experience in real time. On the data side, we're collecting a lot of information about what's going on, both from the device perspective and the server perspective. From the device, we're understanding what is that customer experience really like? Who are you as a customer? What device are you streaming on? How quickly did it take that video to load? Did you experience any errors or interruptions during the course of that playback? And from the server side, we're capturing information about that same series of transactions, but thinking about it from the server's own perspective. What ISP was I connected to to deliver that content? How many bytes did I transfer in each connection? How long did it take those bytes to arrive at their destination? What was the latency? All of these raw logs are landing in Amazon S3, which we use as our main storage system. And my team comes in and is using some business logic and windowing and some sophisticated tooling to process all this data, merge it together, and at the end of the day, we create a data set that combines the perspective of the customer experience with the network experience. This is a really critical data set at Netflix because it's the only place you can go to to understand how the network experience really affects what our customers are seeing when they stream Netflix. This is, you know, just throwing a slide here with a picture of what some of this data looks like. Don't read too much into it, but the point is it's got a lot of different types of data that we're looking at. We have metrics, we have dimensions. This is just a tenth of the columns that we look at, and we're writing out over, well over a billion records every single day. So as I mentioned, this is a very core data set for Netflix, and we've stood this up recently, and we're now in the process of instilling a bunch of data quality and anomaly detection checks on this data set. There are four main considerations that I have when we do these uh, checks, and so I'll walk through them one by one, and we'll, we'll kind of cover them uh, as we go along. The first is the impact. I mentioned this is a, a very important table for us, and so it makes sense for us to invest into making sure the data is of high quality and that we understand how it changes over time. Any data set really should have a, a bare minimum of data checks in place, but this is one that's being used by many different people and we're making pretty important decisions with it, so it's actually worth a little bit more investment above and beyond what the bare minimum is. We're making decisions like, which partnerships might we want to invest in, which ISPs or which devices could bring valuable partnerships to Netflix, or where should we invest our internal engineering resources, where do we have the most performance problems, and then we need to let, uh, make sure that our software engineers are addressing those problems. Next is data integrity. I described two sources of data that we deal with, the devices and the servers, but in reality there's actually six data sources we use in this data pipeline. That means that there are six places where things can go wrong. When I talk about data integrity, here's an example of, of what I mean. It's really thinking about the source inputs into uh, whatever your ETL pipeline is. 
Where this can go wrong is if you've got missing data. For maybe you've got a hive table with some partitions and the partitions don't exist or they don't have data in them. Maybe you have some unexpected data types flowing through, nulls when, the, when there shouldn't be. Perhaps you have some malformed records that mean that you can't parse out key value pairs that you want to parse out. We found it's best to be able to detect these types of data integrity issues during or even before your ETL processing. We do this before by looking at metadata about our source input tables. So we have a, we, luckily at Netflix we have a metadata service that gives us information about our Hive metadata. We can say, uh, is that partition loaded? How many rows are there? Is there, what's the min and max values that exist within that column? What's the cardinality of that column? And if we have suspicions that things aren't quite right there, then we can choose to do something about whether we want to process that data or not. We also want to make sure we quantify what's happening during our ETL processing. So there's uh, business logic that tells us we should throw away some percentage of data that we're reading in. It's just not relevant for the output data set. Uh, so we want to quantify how much we throw away, though. If, it, that, that, if that's 5% one run and it goes to 50% the next time, then it may not even indicate a big problem, but it's something we, we want to be able to know and alert on. So once you have those checks in place, you get to decide what to do with them. If, that's ha if the case I just described is happening where you're, um, you're throwing away a lot more data, maybe you're comfortable continuing to process it and release that data for downstream consumption, but maybe you're not. It's going to depend on your use case. If your source data is totally missing, then yeah, don't even start that ETL process. Oops. Lastly, uh, the, these are really... Uh, I shouldn't say easy, but these are problems that can be addressed with reusable frameworks. Virtually any pipeline needs that kind of data integrity check on your source data, so we can try to make this reusable and extensible. At Netflix, we are working uh, between our data engineering teams and our data platform teams to make sure that we can address these uh, data quality questions on source table. Every time you, you write out data, you can audit it before you even publish it to be uh, available for downstream consumption. And that's going to go a long way to letting us be sure that the tables that we're uh, ingesting for our source data are completely fine in terms of the, the main metadata about them to allow us to focus more time on addressing business metric issues that require a little bit more uh, domain knowledge and those are a little bit more complicated. And we'll talk about the business metrics next. This pipeline has uh, dozens of metrics that we care about looking at and dozens of dimensions. You think about the thousands of devices that Netflix customers are streaming on, the, the thousands of ISPs that they're connected to. We operate in almost 200 countries. There's just many dimensions and they have high cardinality. So it makes it a challenge to figure out where things are changing when there's so many permutations. And this is where anomaly detection really starts to shine. When I talk about business metric shifts, I, I think about things like, in our world, we look at error rates. We don't want to make sure that we know when those are changing. We also might want to know when our customer's consumption of Netflix is changing in some way. This is a really interesting one because you may see a shift, a very uh, sudden spike that's very visible in terms of how people are changing consumption, but there also might be a longer term shift that you're going to want to detect and that might require different types of algorithms and a different approach. Another one that comes up uh, pretty frequently is a metric shift that's caused by a change in logging. We have a lot of normalized or ratioed metrics, the percentage of playback sessions that experience some type of event. And often uh, they change, not because there's actually a change in the customer experience, but because some uh, logging issue has happened where the numerator or the denominator has been impacted. We, wanna, we definitely wanna make sure we catch those. Let's walk through an example. So let's say this is a global playback error rate, the percentage of, of sessions that end in a fatal error for our customers. It's not, so don't read into the data, but just for example. Uh, and this, is, this is a key metric that our executive team does track, so we want to make sure that we, we have our eyes on this. And let's say that the spike is actually being caused only by Android phones in the country of Brazil that are having some, some crazy issue. We want to be able to know that. Because as the owners of this data, as the stewards of this metric and this pipeline, 
Uh, we want to be the ones who can talk about it and describe it and annotate it before the CEO comes knocking on our door. So first we need to identify what changed. We need to know that it was the Android phones in Brazil that are causing this problem. We're taking a very simple approach. I mentioned we're standing this up right now, so it's still uh, in early days. But we can do this by pre-aggregating data to various grains that we think are meaningful. In our case, devices and countries are very common dimensions across which our metrics do shift. So we define that as a level of aggregation to run anomaly detection on. Uh, we're, we're using a JSON config to describe what uh, dimensions and metrics to pre-compute and pass over to our anomaly detection service. We'd say, give me a time series, give me days and hours and device types and countries to be able to pass over to that service, run our anomaly detection algorithms on, and receive that time series back with annotated data points on which seem anomalous. This is very simplistic. I, I will absolutely admit that we, a much better solution would be to be able to automatically detect the places where these, uh, these problems are occurring. We can't pre-aggregate to every single potential roll-up, and that's, it's just really not, not scalable. It's really, at the end of the day, a dimensionality reduction problem, and we think we can get there and be a little bit smarter, but we're going to start small. Next up is defining our sensitivity around alerting. We could go crazy with uh, being very sensitive to any type of metric shift, but that's probably not going to be very meaningful to us. So I, I do think we're making the right choice by starting pretty conservatively here. Pick the, the top metrics that you care about and you want to know have changed, and make sure you're just alerting on those to the right people. And you can scale that up and tune over time. So we know what happened, and we know we want to alert on it. How do we do that alerting? We've chosen to use emails for this. Emails are great at Netflix because they're very push. They're not pull. You get something in your inbox that tells you there's an action you need to take. There's an investigation you need to perform. And that's much better. We get more response than if someone has to go to a pull mechanism to go to, say, an anomaly dashboard and figure out what's meaningful for them. So we really like the emails here. And we think about providing context here as well. I, I firmly believe that a picture is worth a thousand words, which is ironic because there's no picture on this slide. But uh, you know, we, we could absolutely include a link to this, this change in the error rate with uh, the Android phones in Brazil. And we also want to provide a link to an interactive dashboard that lets a human being be able to explore this problem a little bit more. Maybe the first question you're going to say or have after you see this problem is that, uh, is, are there other devices that are impacted in the same country, but maybe to a lesser extent? Or is there a cyclical problem with Android that's actually just now going out of bounds and, and we're finally capturing it? And then finally, personalization is key as well. This takes a little bit more work because it involves figuring out who cares about what and managing Google groups or distribution lists. But it's very possible and actually I think goes a long way to making sure that you're not being too aggressive or spammy with your alerting. You know, we've got a PM for Brazil and a PM for Android. Those are going to be the people that have the most context about what's going on to potentially cause these issues. And they're going to be the ones who are most invested in um, actually helping us solve them. That's going to go a long way to make sure that um, the right people know about different types of problems. And finally, scale. This is, this is a fun one for Netflix. Uh, scale is a couple of different things in my mind. It's, it's really the scale of the data that we're processing here, but it's also the way we scale our anomaly detection framework. I mentioned that this data set has well over a billion and a half, or something like a billion and a half records every day. And uh, that means that it's a lot of data to process. And in our current phase where we're doing that pre-aggregation of data, if we had to do that in a MapReduce environment, th those pre-aggregations would take a really long time. If we want to do that on 40 different rollups, for example, that's, that's not really going to scale very well. It's going to take up a lot of cluster resources. Uh, luckily for us, we've chosen to take our data um, outside of Hive and put a, a recent copy of it into Elasticsearch for visualization purposes. That's been a very successful technology at Netflix. And the great thing is there, we have an indexed data store, and so we can very quickly query that data back for all of our pre-aggregation steps and pass it along to our anomaly detection service. Uh, 
Another technology that we found great at Netflix has been Druid, an OLAP data store with similar response times. And note that this is all related to a batch processing framework, you know, daily or hourly batch. If you're doing stream processing and you want to run anomaly detection, you're going to have some slightly different technology considerations. How do we scale the anomaly detection framework itself? I've been describing this as a, as a service that we call. So, you know, there it's, and it sounds somewhat magical, but we take a time series of data, we pass it along to the service. We're doing data transfer across a network and then getting that data back, and that's, that's really not terribly efficient. We want to be able to have a service that scales, so uh, this, the same core set of algorithms actually exists as a library as well that we can invoke in our code to run in the same infrastructure where the data actually resides. So that's one way to scale. At Netflix, we talk about a shared anomaly detection framework, and that also means that you're going to want more people to use it, more people to contribute to it, which contributes to a scale problem. One of the, the uh, most interesting things we've done is make the scalability work in terms of contribution and evaluation of algorithms. We make it very easy for anyone to contribute a new algorithm to our code base and also to evaluate its performance. So if I'm, I'm contributing some new algorithm that we don't already have, I can take a particular data set, run my anomaly detection on that data set, and see how it performs against all the existing algorithms which is great for a contributor, but also for a developer. If I have a, a data set and I don't exactly know which kind of algorithm I should use, should it be in a quartile range, should it look at three sigma deviation, uh, are those going to be sufficient, or maybe I should go to something more complex like DB scan or robust anomaly detection, this type of evaluation framework that's automated helps me get there. Okay, so we talked about the four considerations there, and in conclusion, I'll give you guys a couple minutes before lunch. Uh, I think we can all be a little bit more like Miles. Data quality and anomaly detection should be some of the first things that we think about when we design data pipelines, when we consume data, not an afterthought. It's not something that we should think about uh, as adding when we have some spare cycles because we all know that that free time very rarely comes along. Using our domain expertise as uh, the folks who care most about the data or working with the business users who use it the most is really critical too. We want to make sure that we're alerting on the right kinds of metrics and to the right levels. So not too little and not too much. What's going to be best for um, the entire organization? And lastly, it's, it's great to think about how to scale these frameworks because these types of problems do not exist in isolation. We should not try to solve them in isolation. Developing uh, a great practice in your data organization around sharing different problems and solutions and frameworks for data quality will go a long way and your entire data org can build a culture and muscle around data discipline. As the data folks here, as the analytics folks and the data engineers, data credibility and data expertise are some of the most valuable assets that we bring to our organizations. Providing high quality data and proactively delivering alerts and insights around how that data changes are really, really great opportunities for us to seize. And the good news is that they're absolutely achievable if we just make them a priority. That's it. Uh, one of the things you talked about were six approaches about data integrity, and one of them was, you know, possible null instances in your JSON. How tolerant you are when some of the fields are null? Because if you are actually getting data at, at regular intervals, it's possible that some of the fields are null. Do you keep track of how many nulls you've actually seen in the data, and then you can check it out? Or we can say, no, after n number of nulls for this particular imperative data, I'm going to stop processing. 
how do you how do you actually deal with those kinds of? Uh, it, it's certainly a problem. You know, if you have null values coming in and you shouldn't, you want to be able to count that at the very least. Uh, we use Spark counters in most of our pipelines to be able to at least quantify what it is that we're missing. And the decision on what to do with that is going to depend. You know, there are some places where if that's a really critical field, you, you may not even want to, you, you want to stop right there. In other cases, you may be a little bit more lenient. It's going to really depend on how that data is being used, and so it's, it's going to be a little bit of a judgment call. But certainly being able to quantify that in any field or um, type of structure that you're processing is, is really key. So I was kind of curious on when you're talking about anomalies and changes in viewing patterns. Um, one of the things that is always a challenge seems to be is taking into account um, time of day, day of week, and those kind of things. Is that something that you guys have to build into the algorithms that check for anomalies, or how, how do you handle that? Seasonality is, is a big one, and we certainly have, you know, seasonal patterns of viewing or, or really any metric can tend to have some type of pattern that's, uh, that you see um, periodically. So a lot of algorithms are actually pretty well designed to address that. I think cold wilderness is one where you get to kind of observe that seasonal pattern and learn from it in the data. The robust anomaly detection framework that is open sourced by Netflix actually takes into account weekly seasonal patterns is how it was developed. So it, it, it is, it's really important to think about what that data looks like to be able to figure out what you want to think is an anomaly. Because if you just had a very simple kind of detection, then you know, your weekly spike might look like something that's more problematic. But there are, the, great, the great news is there are algorithms that can help you address that. But it also takes a little bit of domain knowledge about what that data is looking like. Uh, so for an organization that runs, I presume, like uh, thousands of A-B tests, I'd imagine there are like sort of intended anomalies, right? So is there, you know, these are things that are intended viewing pattern changes. Like how do you, is there a human in the loop to the extent so you know that, you know, this is a new release expected, but, you know, really thinking about across dozens of A-B tests? It's a good question. Oh, certainly we're changing our product and testing it to see what's better for our customers and trying to roll those changes out. And um, a lot of times, We'll see impacts from um, testing, actually not because they're so large scale, but really more on the logging side. So that, that new version we wanted to spin up for a different product experience, it, you know, we didn't think about making sure the logging was coming through correctly. So there's a lot of time that we need to spend to make sure the logging is there to be able to even do that evaluation. And sometimes we'll see that come through in higher order metrics. Um, it's, that's, that's where it's really critical to have that context around what's changing and making sure we can loop in the right people. Like maybe that personalization process can involve the A-B testing team who kind of says, oh yeah, I, sorry, we, we pushed a change. That's what's causing uh, your spike in your metrics. Um, but there, and there, there's always gonna be some amount of noise in the data due to those types of product experiences that we're testing. Um, how much of this framework is open source, or how much is it shared with you know the larger community? The robust anomaly detection framework is open source. If you Google for it, RAD, um, you'll find it on our tech blog. Uh, that was originally written in Pig, so it, it you know it might be uh, useful for anyone who's using that language. Uh, the the framework that we're developing with our data infrastructure team around making sure that source data is not um, making sure it's clean before it's released to be consumed is something that's actually under active development right now, and I'm not sure if we're planning to open source that or not, but I, I can check with them. Hey, Laura, great talk. So another question, uh, have you guys played with streaming algorithms like sketching, hyperlog log, stuff like that? I'm probably not the best person to talk about the streaming infrastructure because I'm not using it, but I know I have some colleagues here who are, so I'll let them speak to it or you can come find us at the office hours. Sounds good, thanks. Okay. How big is the data team to the, that built the RAD system? RAD is interesting because it actually was collaboration with multiple data teams at Netflix. Uh, we have uh, a data engineering and analytics group 
something like 100 people, so that's data engineers, data analysts. I know, it's like a lot of people. <laughs> um, and so that, that's, that's one group who's working on kind of making sure that that kind of framework scales and applying it to the business. And it was a partnership with the science and algorithms team, so more of um, our data science group who was working on the exact algorithms to you know, figure out that seasonality and how to handle it. Um, so a nice little partnership there.